All right, welcome back to 5 Minute Sono. This is Mike Mallon. Today we're going to talk about diastology or diastolic function of the heart. To evaluate the diastolic function of someone's heart, we're going to start off by using mitral inflow velocities, and then we're going to apply some tissue Doppler to evaluate the movement of the tissue. Let's start with mitral valve inflow. Now what you're going to want to do is get an apical four-chamber view of the heart, just like this, with a nice view of the mitral valve, and make sure that you can see the entire left atrium. You'll want to place the pulsed wave Doppler gate right at the tips of the mitral valve leaflets just when they're open. So right there at the tips, and then once you hit pulse wave Doppler again, it's going to give you these velocities. And this is the blood flow as it's moving into the left ventricle. You'll notice that there's two peaks. There's an E wave and an A wave. E stands for early filling, and A stands for the atrial kick. Here's a graph of what that's going to look like in normal diastolic function. So this is a person who has normal filling pressures. They've got no diastolic dysfunction. Uh, their E wave is going to be greater than their A wave. As we start to obtain diastolic dysfunction, you'll notice the E wave is less than the A wave. And that's because you're getting more restriction to blood flow into the left ventricle. You've got a less compliant ventricle. The ventricle is basically not accepting blood quite as well. And the atria has to kick a little bit more to fill the blood into the left ventricle. As we progress down towards worsening diastolic dysfunction to pseudonormal, now we're seeing increased left atrial pressures, E becomes greater than A again, and then as we get to restrictive filling, which is the worst, uh, you'll notice that E is significantly greater than A. Now you'll also notice that normal diastolic function and pseudonormal diastolic function look pretty similar, and it can be hard to tell the difference between the two. That is one reason that we started using tissue Doppler to evaluate the difference between the normal and pseudonormal. Now, tissue Doppler is basically pulsed wave Doppler, but we're measuring the velocity of the tissue. Here, we're going to put the pulse wave gate right at the annulus of the mitral valve on the septal side, so the septal mitral valve annulus, and the gate goes right there where the valve inserts into the septum. What we're looking for here is an E prime wave and an A prime wave, and that's measuring the velocity of the tissue during diastole. We'll notice that the in normal function, the E prime wave is going to be greater than the A prime wave. Now, as we progress to worsening function, we'll actually see that the E prime wave becomes less than the A prime wave, and it'll be less than seven. So an E prime of greater than seven typically tells you that you've got normal diastolic function and an E prime less than seven suggests that there is some abnormality of the of diastolic function, but it doesn't necessarily imply that there's increased filling pressures. What we really want to know is, does the patient have increased filling pressures? And we start to notice that when the patient has either pseudonormal or restrictive filling. A nice way to assess for that is actually doing something called the E over the E prime. So we get into this question of, great, we know that the patient has normal or impaired relaxation. We know that they've got pseudonormal restrictive filling, but really clinically what you want to know is what is the filling pressure to the left ventricle? What's the left atrial pressure? Because that determines who's going to be symptomatic, and that's what's clinically relevant. So how do we get to that? Is there an increase in filling pressure or not? Well, luckily, there's an easy equation that is pretty applicable in most patients, and that is E over E prime. So if we take the velocity of the E wave, which we got from our mitral valve inflow, we divide that by the velocity of the E prime wave, which we got from the TDI, if that's less than 8, we know that that person has normal diastolic function and they do not have increased filling pressures. However, if we divide E by E prime and we find that that number is greater than 15, we know that that person has increased filling pressures. So if we're really going to get to the clinical significance of diastolic function, E over E prime is the fastest way to do that. Less than 8, normal filling pressure. Greater than 15, abnormal filling pressure. The problem is, what do you do when it's between 8 and 15? That's when things get a little bit complicated. The easiest thing to do would, say, would be to say, we don't really know whether the patient has increased filling pressures based on diastolic function. But there's a few other tiebreakers that you can use. So say your patient has an E over E prime of, I don't know, we'll say 12. But if they've got an elevated or an increased left atrial area, that would suggest that they've got diastolic dysfunction. And that 12 may mean that they've got increased filling pressures. Or if you take a look at the lungs and you notice they have B lines, I would also use that as a tiebreaker to suggest that the patient has acute diastolic dysfunction and heart failure. So to summarize, if your patient has an E over E prime of less than eight, they've got normal filling pressures or a normal left atrial pressure. All right. 
That's it for this week's 5-Minute Sono. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to send me an email or tweet. And as always, don't forget to subscribe. Go to blog.5minutesono.com forward slash subscribe. Type in your name and email in the little text boxes. And if you want these podcasts sent directly to your smart devices, go to iTunes or whatever other podcasting service you use. Type in 5-Minute Sono, leave me a rating or review, and subscribe.